that we're gathered here on a day that is both solemn and joyous, and I have a devotion to share with us uh, about family. Deuteronomy 25, verses 2 and 3, says that if you obey the Lord your God, blessed shall you be in the city, and blessed, blessed shall you be in the field. Now, Jesus transformed our view of family when he said that anyone who did God's will was his brother or sister or mother. By refusing to give preference to biology, Jesus was showing that it was God's intention that barriers come down. We find this not only in the Gospels, but throughout the Scriptures. Wherever people are divided, we see God united. Whether it's ethnicity, or gender, or social status, or cultural lifestyle, God's promise is for all. But a shame then that in our own country we see people being pulled apart, and when we look around the world, we see warfare. Why are we so easily convinced of something that is so loudly contradicted in the Bible? Luke eleven twenty eight 28 says, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey. Let us pray. We pray to you, O God, for you love everyone. We pray to you for those whom we have named our enemies. Deliver us from the hardness of heart that keeps us locked in confrontation. Deliver us from the hatred that binds us to old ways. Grant unto all people the blessing of your love, and grant unto us such transformation of our lives that we may make peace with our enemies, and that together, we might make this world a safer place for all, as we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Let's now settle in and listen to the prelude that Anne, on her birthday, has prepared for us.
Elder this morning on this beautifully sunny day. I know for some, though, it might be a day of reflection or worry, but may we find comfort by being together in body as well as in spirit. We are disciples of Christ, a movement for wholeness in a fragmented world. United in spirit and inspired by God's grace, we welcome all, love all, and seek justice for all. May God's peace be with you. And also with you. All right, I have several announcements. Um, as always, there are masks available in our effects if you so choose to wear one and need one. Prayer um, requests will be collected during the children's sermon time. And don't forget this afternoon at St. Mary's at 3 o'clock is the memorial service. The faith formation class for youth 12 and up begins March 6th. And if you have a child that is interested, to contact Heather or Sam. Ash Wednesday is quickly approaching on March 2nd, and there will be a service at 7 p.m. And during Lent, there will be a Bible study on Wednesdays at 6.30, starting March 9th. If you are in need of small bags of onions, today is your day, because there are many bag, small bags of onions available um, in the fellowship hall, you can grab a bag after church. Um, if they lasted long enough, you could use the onions in your Project Hope donation. There is, like that segue, there is a um, clipboard in the fellowship hall for the March 10th meal sign up, and you can um, sign up for that in the fellowship hall. Also in the fellowship hall, there is a, the flower calendar is available. So if you are interested in dedicating flowers on an upcoming Sunday, please sign up on the calendar. And on March 13th, please mark your calendars because we will be having an ice cream social after church for Spring Forward Sunday. And probably the biggest announcement I have today is that please join everyone after church in the fellowship hall for our very own Ann Dorsum's birthday celebration. Would you please rise in body or spirit for our call to worship? The Lord is great in Zion. He is exalted over all nations. We will worship him on this holy day. Let us praise God's great and awesome name. We will worship at his holy mountain, for the Lord our God is holy. Please join me in singing our hymn, Fairest Lord Jesus, which is number 95 in the hymnal. 97, sorry.
your heart, you reveal the beauty of your face. Strengthen our faith during today's worship, that we may embrace the mystery of the cross. Open our hearts to your transforming power so that we may hold fast to your love and walk the path of true discipleship. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our, our Father, who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us now to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever.
So let's say a prayer today before you go to Sunday school. Dear God, Dear God, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you that he is our friend. Thank you that he is our friend. And thank you that he is your son. And thank you that he is your son. In his name we pray. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. And I think you all are going to Sunday school now, so it's good to see all of you. And we'll see you later. Hopefully we'll stay for coffee today. Or juice or whatever it's done. I drank coffee. If you ever wonder what happened, <laughs> I, I won't encourage it. And the kids today, I believe that my grandmother Wa gave me coffee. My sister says when I was three. I remember when I was four. So that's how long I've been drinking coffee. Um, this is from the Interleads. We're thankful that our son Hank is okay after experiencing a rollover accident on a California freeway. His car was totaled, but he is okay. Um, this is from Ross. I had another one up here from Ross from I think about a month ago where Tippy ate a cactus. It keeps reappearing on my pulpit. I think I finally threw that away. I assume Tippy has only eaten the one cactus? Yes. Okay. Only one. Only one. So Tippy's okay. Um, Roz's cousin Nancy is having surgery for an aortic aneurysm on Wednesday. My father had one of those. I know how serious that is. Um, prayers for the people of Ukraine and for peace to prevail. Um, I have a couple, I have three more requests here. Um, Steve is not with us today. Steve Moore is on his way to Warren to see his son Paul, who's in a facility there. This will be the first time that Steve has seen his son in months. So let's keep Steve and his family in our prayers. And speaking of Warren, this is a personal request. I'm sure most of you all, when you grew up, you had your parents and their closest friends and there was sort of a little set of, of people in your life. And in that set of people, the only one left in my family and that set of friends is Warren Bocard, um, one of my parents' best friends who is in hospice and probably won't make it through the day. So I'm praying for Warren and the Bocard family. Um, and we're praying for Denise, who's a friend of Melissa Thompson, who is hospitalized right now. As we mentioned those prayers, we're also thinking, as Ross said, about the situation in Europe the invasion of Ukraine, and it's a much more personal day for many of the people of Chardon, as we remember the incident of uh, February 27th, 2012. Um, because this is such a special day of prayer, I've asked Roz if she would Roz. This is Roz. This is Anne. I've asked Anne if she would provide us with some music for our meditation. So let us go into silent meditation and listen to the music that Anne will play. <laughs>
for the beauty of creation, gratitude for the kindness of your people, gratitude for your grace that leads to our wholeness. We are thankful, but make us ever more thankful for the blessings of this life. Yet, our joy is ever touched by sadness. In the midst of life, we seem to be surrounded by death. Our peace is threatened by conflict. Justice so often takes a back seat to oppression. As we cling to courage, do not forsake us if we quail at the memory of gun violence in our schools. As we grasp at hope, stay with us as we are staggered by the realities of invasion and war. Though the world would leave us wallowing in despair, we trust in the gospel, the good news that you know us, that you became one of us, and that you lead us beyond the grave to life in all its fullness. It is with the confidence that comes from our faith in your Son that we pray for all those who were and still are affected by the Chardon High School shooting. Because he shines a light in the night, we see the light of Christ in our own darkness. Because the crucified one triumphed over death, we hope for deliverance for the victims of war this morning, especially for the people of Ukraine. Though now our hands are folded and our eyes closed, we pray that you will give us the grace to accompany those who mourn and empower us to speak up, to rise up in truth as we speak the truth to power, to make peace and to work for justice. Grant us wisdom, love, and courage, O God, to face the days that are before us. In the name of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, God forevermore. Amen. <coughs> Today's scripture reading is from Luke's Gospel, chapter 9, verses 28 through 36. This passage occurs about eight days after Jesus had shared with his disciples some teachings about discipleship. Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed, and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly, they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to him. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, which, we, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep, but since they had stayed awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Just as they were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them. And they were terrified as they entered the cloud. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent and in those days told no one any of the things they had seen. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks. Thanks be to God. 
we will now sing a wondrous sight, a vision fair. And that is an insert in your bulletin, and you may remain seated for this thing. Feast 
of the transfiguration of Jesus. Now, no matter where we read it, whether it's in Matthew 17 or Mark 9 or Luke 9, the story is almost exactly the same in every detail. Jesus brings Peter, James, and John with him up a mountain to pray, and while they're praying, something happens. In Matthew and Mark, Jesus is transfigured. That's the word the Bible uses, but it's, it's in Greek, of course, and that Greek word looks, looks a lot more like our word for metamorphosis, but we say transfigured in English. But in Luke, it doesn't mention the word transfigured. It says that he's changed. But whatever verb is used, the exact same thing happens. And when the bright light that suddenly surrounds Jesus um, appears, Moses and Elijah are found with Jesus. That is the giver of the law and the greatest of the prophets. They're there to confirm once and for all, at least to these three close disciples, that Jesus is Messiah. In every version of the story, Peter speaks up. Now, when we read in the Bible of Peter speaking up, or a disciple, period, speaking up, it's almost always Peter. Peter is sort of like the spokesperson for all the other disciples. And so here in every version of the Transfiguration story, Peter speaks up. Now, whether he's scared, or nervous, or excited, we're not exactly sure, but something causes him to suggest that they do something to make what they're looking at permanent, or at least semi-permanent. Let's build shelters for all three of them, Jesus, Moses, and Elijah, he says. But as soon as the words are out of his mouth, a cloud comes down, and then nobody can see anything. Except there's a booming voice that comes out of the cloud. And of course, it's, it's the voice of God. And I like the way when Jenny read it, she spoke up quite a bit. You could tell it was God's voice <coughs> that was speaking. And the voice said, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. Except in Luke, which is what we just heard, Jesus is the chosen son, not the beloved son. And then the cloud disappears and everything is sort of back to normal. Jesus is there alone and the disciples are left wondering what they just saw. Now in today's reading, Luke tells us that Peter, James, and John told no one what they had seen at the top of the mountain. Matthew and Mark put it just a little bit differently, but it's basically the same thing. In Matthew and Mark, we, we see why they didn't tell anybody anything. It's because Jesus specifically told them not to tell anybody anything. So even here, the evangelists agree. The glory of Christ simply cannot be understood apart from the whole story of Christ's life. If the disciples were to descend the mountain and share the, the story of the glory of Christ shining forth on the mountain, it would be out of context because Jesus also taught that he had to suffer and die. So we can't get to the shining face without first seeing, seeing that face in the throes of agony, the agony of the cross. That's the way Jesus experienced life and death and then glorification the way God wants us to understand Jesus. And then Jesus, Peter, James, and John must all descend again, once again down into the valley and be confronted by a troubled world. And that's exactly what happens. In all three of the accounts in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and I'll say again what I say a million times, those three Gospels are called the Synoptic Gospels. So in all three of these synoptic Gospels, um, Jesus and the disciples descend the mountain to confront trouble in the world. At the foot of the mountain, there is already a crowd gathered. At the foot of the mountain, there's also a commotion. It seems that a sick child has been brought by his father. 
But the remaining disciples, remember only three of them went up the mountain with Jesus. The remaining disciples are unable to do anything for that child. In all three of the Gospels that tell of this event, Jesus heals the boy at this point. In Matthew and Luke, Jesus wonders aloud why it is that he has to put up with the faithlessness of his followers. Sort of a discouraging little passage, but it's there. But it's Mark that I like best. He puts it a little bit differently. Because here in Mark, when the disciples ask why they couldn't do anything for the boy when Jesus could, Jesus responds with a, an answer that sounds a little bit flippant. I wonder how he really meant it. Jesus responds that cases like this require prayer. So in all three synoptic gospels, the story of the transfiguration begins and ends with prayer. Jesus climbs the mountain in order to pray. Prayer revealed the true nature of Jesus, and he shone as bright as the sun. Prayer connected him to the tradition. That's when Moses appeared, and that's what rep Moses represented. And prayer connected him to God's power to change our reality. And that's what Elijah, the prophet, represented. And it was after Jesus prayed that God said, This is my Son, beloved and chosen. Listen to him. And then after all of this, he brings wholeness to a boy, a child of God, once again through prayer. So we see prayer started this whole thing, and prayer is what ended the story. And in Mark, he specifically says that it was only through prayer that the wholeness of this boy was, was brought about. Prayer, then, is what surrounds and inspires the Christian life. It's what makes mountaintop experiences happen. And it's what enables us to face what awaits us down in the valley. <clears throat> Prayer gets us through the hardships of our pilgrimage. And each of us has a pilgrimage in life. And prayer reveals the glory that awaits us at the end of the journey. Now, there are probably preachers out there somewhere who are able to compartmentalize better than I can, who can talk about this story of the Transfiguration and what happened afterwards without letting current, event, current events affect what they say. But of course, I am not such a preacher, at least not, not today. Today, I feel like I'm part of a community that cannot forget its pain. Today, we honor our grief as we think about the events that happened here in Chardon 10 years ago. And as we do so, I think many of us will remember how our prayers were able to transform our grief into prayers to do better and to be better. In our church, those prayers often take visible form because they continue to this day. Because we received a gift of a thousand peace cranes after what happened 10 years ago, we have folded thousands upon thousands of peace cranes since February 27th, 2012. Each one of them represents a prayer for peace and a commitment to end violence, and all of those are then sent elsewhere to give others hope and to help others see light at the end of the tunnel. Today also, we are reminded of our smallness. What can regular little people like us do in the face of all-out warfare, in the face of the naked aggression of one vast nation against a much smaller one. I know that Vladimir Putin will never know, much less care about, 
The fact that I changed my Facebook cover picture this week to a photo of the Ukrainian flag. But God will care. Not so much that I posted another picture, but that I can turn to God in prayer. Just as Christ was glorified on the mountain, then returned to the valley to minister to a little child, so God Most High hears the prayers of God's little ones. And sometimes that includes me and you. And it is to the little ones, I think, that God pays most attention. This is not some left-wing ideology on my part that I'm throwing out at you. And by the way, I note today that nearly everybody's sitting on this side. <laughs> and I know when you entered, you thought you were sitting on the right. Just remember, you are to my left. <laughs> now this is not just some left-wing ideology that I'm throwing at you here. It is pure scripture, occurring at least 20 times in the Hebrew Bible. I'm going to give you a few examples of what I'm talking about. Psalm 918 tells us that the needy shall not always be forgotten, nor the hope of the poor perish forever. There's a whole bunch of places in the Psalms where this occurs. In Proverbs 14.21, we read that those who despise their neighbors are sinners, but happy are those who are kind to the poor. And Isaiah said that with righteousness, Messiah shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. In every one of those verses and many others, the Hebrew word anawim is the word that's used. Whether it's translated as poor or humble or meek, these are God's little ones and God pays attention to them. And when the world forgets them, or when the powerful move against them, God sees and God cares. Now, I used to think that it was on purpose, but apparently it's just a coincidence that there is a great Christian poet, or was a great Christian poet, she died in 2016, who often wrote about God's little ones, God's Anna Wien, and her name was Anne Weems. That was her real name. She married, her name was Anne, and she married a man named Weems. And she wrote a poem that probably comes closest to what I would want to say today. And I want to make it my own this morning. In fact, this is what I will close today's sermon with. I'll read this poem by Anne Weems. On the edge of war, one foot already in, I no longer pray for peace. I pray for miracles. I pray that stone hearts will turn to tender heartedness, and evil intentions will turn to mercifulness. And all the soldiers already deployed will be snatched out of harm's way, and that the whole world will be astounded onto its knees. I pray that all the God talk will take bones and stand up and shed its cloak of faithlessness and walk again in its powerful truth. I pray that the whole world might sit down together and share its bread and wine. Some say there is no hope, but then I've always applauded the holy fools who never seem to give up on the scandalousness of our faith, that we are loved by God, that we can truly love one another. I no longer pray for peace. I pray for miracles. who said, let light shine out of darkness, has also shown in our hearts, that we may see the light of the knowledge of God's glory 
in the face of Jesus Christ. In gratitude for Christ's transforming power, we offer our gifts during worship. As the deacons bring the offering forward, let us rise and sing the doxology. again into the valley. So let us go forth with courage to do what is right. Let us go forth with hope that the right will prevail. And let us go forth with love, refusing to hate those whom we think are wrong. In the name of God, Creator, Christ, and Holy Spirit, go now in peace. Amen. Amen. <laughs> 